here we are again. Uh, Logics for Computer Science, classic and non-classical. I'm the author. And today we are in chapter seven. And chapter seven really deals finally in intuitionistic and modal logics. We have five parts. So first we we'll do philosophical motivation for intuitionistic logic, which is very important because that gave a whole birth to a new way of thinking about mathematics, not only philosophy. And part two, uh, we'll talk about intuitionistic proof systems, special or one of intuitionistic proof system. And we'll discuss algebraic semantics and completeness theorem. And then we will do a uh, like kind of a discussion of connection of intuitionistic and tautologic and classical tautologies, because in this way you can have a better feeling what, which are the differences between intuitionistic thinking and classical thinking. And then we will do automatic theorem proving. It means that we will do Gensel sequence system for intuitionistic propositional uh, uh, for propositional logic, decidability and everything, completeness theorem, by the methods we've already did for the previous system. So the methods we already develop works also for intuitionistic logic, which is very uh, not, uh, anyway, we'll talk, discuss it. And then we'll do a short uh, uh, introduction to modal logics, uh, really not all modal logics will, uh, discuss two very important as four as and uh, modal logic as four and modal logic as five. So intuitionistic logic, here we are. So intuitionistic logic was developed as a result of certain philosophical views on the foundation of mathematics, and it is known as intuitionism. And it was originally uh, originated by Brouwer in 1908, so it had been a long time. The first Hilbert style formalization for intuitionistic logic, it existed only as a proof system, uh, is due to Heiting in 1930. It means there was a lot of discussion, very long time, and mathematicians at that time agree, and philosophers agree that Hey, the ax axiomatics, ax the axioms which Hating developed in 1930 really represents what they think and they agree that that is the intuitionistic logic, formalization. And also we discussed the relationship between intuitionistic and classical logic. And uh, of course, that. So intuitionistic logic was developed only as a proof system, and there were no semantics. And it took uh, another f from uh, 1908, 1930, then to, to 44, 46 was uh, McKinsey and Tarski developed the first semantics of intuitionistic logic and proof completeness theorem. And, and by doing so, and we'll discuss it, uh, they created a new field of mathematics, which is called algebraic logic, because those models are use Boolean algebras, different algebras, that is. And, uh, and then, so that was 44, 46. And then it wasn't until 1964 when Saul Kripke developed a different semantics, not only for intuitionistic logic, but for, mod, uh, for modal logics, which are called Kripke semantics. And it was done in uh, 1964. So you can see 1930 semantics 44 and then 64 another semantics. So uh, and uh, algebraic semantics, the first semantics uh, which is still very strong and very interesting, uh, use the pseudo-Boolean algebra 
And we call them also Haitic algebra to memorize the first accepted formalization of the intuitionistic uh, logic by Haitic. So uh, now the uniform presentation of algebraic models for classical intuitionistic and modal logics to S4, S5 was first given in very now classical book, Mathematics of Metamathematics by Rashova Sikorsky. First edition was 1964. So, uh, but our main goal is to give presentation of intuitionistic logic formulated as Hilbert and Gensen proof system, discuss algebraic semantics, you know, to develop the whole algebraic semantics is uh, half a year or year course. So it's another uh, big, um, but we'll, we'll do enough to understand what's going on. And, and then we'll, we'll talk about relationship between uh, classical and intuitionistic propositional logic. So intuitionistic point of view on the meaning of basic logical and set theoretical concept used in mathematics is different that from that of most mathematicians used in the research. But we have also intuitionistic mathematics and so on. And also intuitionistic logic is very important application, is very important in theory of correctness of programs. That's why it is very important for computer science. The basic difference between intuitionist and classical mathematician lays in the interpretation of the word exist. Exist, you can prove existence not giving the algorithm of finding the, the, the element x for which there is x a x is true. So in this, very often what we do, we do the following. We want to prove, uh, we know that in classical logic, we have that there is x a x is logically equivalent in classical way, negation for all x, not a x. So to prove, I want to prove there is x a x. How we do? I assume, in, in particular, you have that the implication in this direction, a x logical equivalence is stronger than the. Oh, sorry, you see, I am rushing. It's morning, so now I'm slowing down. There is x a x by double negation the Morgan law. So there is x a x. This is one of our classical tautologies. And now what we do to prove there is x, we assume that assume that it's not true. So I assume that not true that for x not a x. And by modus ponens, I get there is x a x. Or I assume this and I and I or I do by contradiction, I assume that this is not true, it means I have that, and then I have a contradiction, so it means this is true. So I prove that and by modus ponens I prove that there is x dot ix. So and so in a in a way you can prove the existence of an element without really uh, giving a way to find that element 
because you do by contradiction, and there's a lot of proofs of, of, of that type. So for this reason, the intuitionists do not accept the classical tautology. So that is one of the basic classical tautologies which we don't accept in intuitionistic logic. And of course, that is, uh, if you construct the proof system, so if you say that this is, you have a proof system, I, and so you assume that intuitionistic logic, any intuitionistic, in any intuitionistic proof system, you cannot prove that. And once you have a, if you build the semantics, that formula also cannot be intuitionistic tautology. And that is connected with uh, interpretation of intuition, intuitionistic implication. It means we say that implication A implies B is considered to be true if there is a method by which a proof of B can be deduced from the proof of A. And the example is, is this, that oh, this is intuitionistic uh, implication. Here is the typo. So, and from that implication, there's no general method. From, the, from a proof of the sentence, of this sentence, to obtain the intuitionistic proof of there is x, ax. And the next is the uh, intu intuitionistic negation. Intuitionistic negation, we have again that in, in classical logic, we have the double negation that the formula A is classically equivalent to double negation A. And, uh, and that is not possible. It means we, we don't accept intuitionistic logic that double negation A, double negation A implies A, and we accept in the proof system or in tautology that we can prove the implication A implies double negation A. So this is, this is OK, and that is not possible in intuitionistic logic. So semantically, you don't have a double negation law, <coughs> which is, as we know, one of the basic laws of classical logic. And the other. Uh, Problem is of disjunction. They, to prove or to have A or B uh, a tautology or to be true, they say that only one sent, only if one sentence of A and B must be true. So to have, so of course immediately you have classical is excluded middle is not acceptable because you can have F. Uh, a can be F, and then it's true, and then it's, it's true. This is uh, this is true, so the whole thing is true. So it means that intuitionistic proof system you cannot prove excluded middle, and an excluded middle is not intuitionistic tautology. So uh, the Hilbert style uh, we, we we define a Hilbert style proof system with the axiom due to Rashova. Because it is uh, very, first of all, that set of axiom is the most natural and appropriate set of axiom to carry the algebraic proof. When you put different proofs, as you saw when we did the proof of uh, classical propositional calculus, you have axioms which are the most uh, convenient to your uh, uh, way, the way you carry the proof. So that's why we do uh, that proof. And the axioms have two. Uh, uh, so we adapt all this are typical classical, that character, character uh, tautologies. They're all nice classical tautologies. Our language is the whole language. And you have 11 axioms. And they ask, 
they are uh, adopted in such a way that our whole algebraic uh, technique of proving completeness theorem, we need all of them one by one. And you have modus ponens, of course, uh, because uh, as the only rule of inference, and uh, because it's very, so then we have a system, and also when we have add extra axiom, which we add to A, if we add the excluded middle, if you put the 12th axiom, which is A odd not A, you get A1, A11 plus is classical, complete classical axiomatization, and this is intuitionistic axiomatization. So you can see it's elegant also, because it means you add the only, you can say the only difference between the classical intuitionistic, which is those 11 axioms, and classical, you just add the most classical uh, tautology, which is uh, A excluded A or not A. So, and then you have a, a normal set of probable probability. You have formally, we have formally defined the, the system I. Semantics. Uh, so this is a very short version of Tarski, Rashova, Sikorsky, pseudo Boolean algebra semantics. We leave the Kripke semantics for the reader to explore from other sources. We cannot cover everything, and there is now a lot of books who, which do the on, only Kripke semantics. So uh, I choose to uh, give uh, a very important semantics, which is less uh, known at this moment, because everybody does Kripke semantics. You have a lot of sources. So, First, the algebra, you start with uh, relatively pseudo-complemented lattices. And I'm not going, so you have lattices, and you have certain properties of those lattices. And then you form algebra B, and you say that algebra B, which I, one is the largest element in the algebra, is relatively pseudo-complemented lattice if and only if that subalgebra is relatively pseudo-complemented lattice with uh, relative pseudo-complement. That is called relative pseudo-complement uh, implication, which is defined by set. And when you look at this, this is similar to H, our H3 three value semantics of hating algebras. So and then and then you do of course everything has a connection like normal Boolean algebra uh, have the connection with Boolean algebra of sets. Here also you have the uh, uh, set interpretation and here if you have uh, a topological space where I is interior operation, really the intu intuitionistic implication is interior of x minus y or z. So complement of y or z. So in classical, uh, in classical, inter in classical algebra of sets, you, you could introduce that A implies B is just X is universe and A, B are subset of the universe. So this is X minus uh, X minus A union B. So it means that is 
corresponds in sets that A implies B is equal not A or B. Negation, classical negation, is just complement of the set. So now, so this is classical. And when you do the intuitionistic uh, uh, implication, when you have here intuitionistic implication, instead of taking a complement of set, you take the interior of the set x minus a. So interior is a little bit just a little bit less than the set. So it's a nice interpretation of the difference between intuitionistic negation and classical negation, which is just complement of the set. And to have intuitionistically, you have the interior of the complement of the set. And you have a pseudo Boolean algebra, which is abstract algebra, when that part is pseudo complemented lattice with zero element zero and the negation, you see, the negation is defined for any element of B, A implies zero. So when you go back to H3, that was how we defined the hating uh, three valuate uh, uh, three valuate logic. Negation was define A implies zero uh, in, uh, in our, or H implies false. Zero would be in our three valued Hayek algebra was zero uh, corresponds to the, our uh, F. Because remember, F was less than unknown, less than true. So F was the smallest element. And in general, the smallest element we denote by zero. And then you have the same, you have a topological, uh, 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 topological interpretation and intuitionistic complement. You can think about in sets that intuitionistic complement of a set is y implies empty set. And this is interior of the complement. That's what I said. You have that property that uh, now, if you have negation of A, I, or the negation, if you want A, would be A implies empty set, which would be interior of X complement of A. You see, so that you have, this is complement intuitionistic complement would be interior. And here you have normal complement of a set. So uh, and that is the set theoretical interpretation of our um, pseudo Boolean algebra. And uh, everything. Uh, that interpretation was proved by Stone in 1936, and it was called the represent Stone Representation Theorem for, uh, for, for, for uh, pseudo Boolean algebras. And then you have, uh, uh, and we say that formula A is intuitionistic tautology. So let's do this. So representation theorem, which they prove in 46, for every pseudo Boolean algebra, they, there exists a monomorphism H of that algebra into pseudo field of GX of open subset of compact topological T0 space. So we are getting into very uh, sophisticated mathematics. So just I want to show you how sophisticated it can be. So we say that. Formula A is intuitionistic tautology if and only if any pseudo Boolean algebra is a model of A. So the notion uh, of pseudo Boolean uh, or model, we write it when you have 
our language, we have a pseudo-Boolean algebra. We say that algebra B is a model for a formula, and we write it like that. If for any V of variables of that language, the V star of A becomes the one, the greatest element in our algebra. Our three value at hating uh, semantics, which we develop in chapter three, is three element, an example of three element pseudo Boolean algebra. And one is T. And, uh, and then it is, uh, is a model, but also you say if that, v a equal 1 holds for all variable assignments into the universe of that algebra. And then we say that formula A is intuitionistic tautology, and we deny the note like that, if and only if B is a model of A for all pseudo-Boolean algebra. So uh, you can see you have all possible, whatever uh, compl complex they are, algebra, which are called pseudo-Boolean algebras. And then you have all possible like uh, truth assignments for the formula in the universe of the algebra. And then you have all possible V and all possible Boolean algebras. Uh, and that's what is uh, A is intuitionistic tautology. And then you have, uh, and now when you look, uh, we have, when you have the intuitionistic proof system, completeness theorem, which was proved by Mostowski in 48, is A is probable in the system, like for example, in the system I gave you at the beginning, if and only if A is, uh, intuitionistic tautology. So, so it means this formula has to be true in all possible algebras under all possible truth assignments in the, uh, for each algebra, you have truth assignment in the universe, all possible truth assignments in the universe of the algebra. So complexity is, and then, you can have even more complex way of stating or approving, and this is called algebraic completeness theorem, that A is probable in our system I, which we started with. A, these are all equivalent. A is intuitionistic tautology. A is valid in every pseudo-Boolean algebra of open subset of topological space A's. Now, that is important part. A is valid, it means it's true, it's tautology, intuitionistic tautology, in every pseudo-Boolean algebra with at most two to the power two to the power r elements where r is the number, number of subformulas of A. That is for intuitionistic propositional. Remember, we are, we are talking about, we talk only our language is, we are talking about this language, so we talk about the propositional intuitionistic calculus. So when you look at this representation theorem, that part means that is the citability of the notion of intuitionistic tautology, because you have to check if A is tautology or is valid in all pseudo-Boolean algebras, which have at most two to the power two, this is a big number, but it's a finite number, with R is the number of subformulas of A. So if A has eight subformulas, it would be two to the power two to the power eight, which is a finite number. And you have looked at all possible pseudo-Boolean algebra with that, so you can evaluate that is a decidability. It's uh, a lot of computation, but you can do it. So that's why uh, that is important part, because that is decidability, uh, semantical decidability of intuitionistic propositional uh, logic. 
and of course we are going to show syntactical decidability because you can see how complex are those algebras and to, and to examine all possible with at most 2 to the power 2 to the r. So you have to one, two, up to their elements. So there's a lot of computation, but mathematically it's, it's finite and it's uh, decidable. So now we can um, look at um, like more feeling what are those horrible tautologies, you can see they're not easy to imagine, uh, by comparing them uh, uh, to what we know it means to our classical tautologies. Like for example, all axioms 11 are classical and intuitionistic tautologies, all our axioms 11, they are classical intuitionistic. Here are other typical classical, A implies A, A implies not dot A, you see with so in one direction, we know that it is not semantically A, A is not intuitionistically double negation, but A implies not not A is intuitionistic tautology. So that is okay, but the inverse implication is not intuitionistic tautology. So, uh, for example, you have you, you also know that A implies B, which is in classically is not A or B and it's not intuitionistically logically equivalent, but implication in this direction holds. That only the implication in this direction is yes in intuitionistic logic and in this direction is no. That's why you don't have logical equivalence. And here is more. I listed so you can like you can see that here look at this that triple negation of a implies a is okay and not a implies triple negation of a so you can say that intuitionistically a is equivalent to a triple negation of a but is not equivalent to double so that means, you see that those tautologies mean that, that A is intuitionistically equivalent to a triple negation of A and so on. People spend a lot of time. Now, these are uh, very basic it, classical tautologies which are not intuitionistic tautology. So a, a or not A, that's what we started with. You see the implication in this direction is not. That is not. That the Morgan law, not A and B, implies not A or not B, is not intuitionistic, and so on. So these are very, this is interesting, because A implies B implies A implies A is very basic classical tautology, which is not intuitionistic tautology. But we have certain connections between classical and intuitionistic logics. And first of all, it was proved in 64 that what I er just erased here, that we add one axiom 12 to a ex uh, excluded middle uh, to our 11 axioms, you, you get the, uh, the complete classical semantics. And of course, because you see, you have immediately, uh, I just repeat because we, uh, I erased it, we have A1, A11 was intuitionistic axioms, and these are complete, intuitionistically, and you add axiom 12, A or not A, you get 
complete classical. So what you get that if you prove intuitionistically A, so it means you have a proof from those 11 axioms, then you prove classically A because you have only extra axioms. So the intuitionistic tautologies are subsets also semantically in classical tautologies, which we just use fat T for classical tautologies. And then I, it is the same if A is intuitionistic tautologies, that is a classical tautologies. Now, this is very important little, not little, theorem. Gliven Kontarski in twenty in 30s, uh, for any formula, A is classically probable if and only if double negation is intuitionistic. So double negation of any classical tautology is intuitionistic tautology by completeness. So you, in any proof system, you have classically probable A if and only if double negation is probable and intuitionist, oh, that was I, I wrote Tarski in 38, he, because he invented already uh, the semantics, so he proved that if A is ta uh, classical tautology, if and only if double negation is intuitionistic tautology and we will use that for creating different examples. And Gödel, in 31 proof that uh, for any formulas, a formula A implies not B is classically probable, if and only if, is intuitionistic probable. So certain formulas of that type, classical and intuitionistic are the same. And also you can, you can do it as tautology. So, and another nice, uh, Gödel theorem that if formula contains no connectives except uh, conjunction and negation, so if you take any formula of this language, you have that A is classically probab probable if and only if is intuitionistically probable. When A is from that language. See, at that time, they were doing this only syntactically by probability because we didn't have yet semantics. And again, uh, you can have, uh, it, once you have a semantics, you have semantical version of that. So this is a semantical version of implication and this is a semantical version of probability of formulas of the language conjunction and negation. Now, there is a theorem which was announced without proof by Gödel in 31. It means he, like Fermat theorem, <laughs> he just said so. Maybe Fermat had a proof of his theorem. But uh, we doubt now because it took a lot of years and um, a lot of extra development of extra mathematics to finally have a proof of Fermat theorem. But anyway, so Gödel stated this theorem and Gensen proved in 35 that in disjunction is intuitionistically probable if and only if you have a proof of A or you have a proof of B. So that was from the beginning what the Brouwer and the whole intuitionistic school wanted from this junction. If I have to prove A or B, it means I have to prove A or I have to prove B and not rub it on the, of the hat that I can have 
a proof or tautology, A or not A, and A, I don't have a proof of A, and I don't have a proof of not A, but I have the proof. Or the same uh, semantically, this is a tautology, and neither must be a tautology. So that was which really started the whole intuitionistic logic. Proof A or B, it means I have this or I have that. So now, uh, Sigenzen did it in 35, and we are going to do it very quickly. Once you have, so the proof, Gensen proof, he invented the whole Gensen type formalization and did all, and then the proof of the theorem is absolutely obvious. So let's now look at the Gensen sequence system Li, which we talk uh, a little bit already. Uh, and I, um, so in order to prove the completeness, uh, uh, they, they, he did completeness uh, of his formalization for classical logic and for intuitionistic logic, showing uh, the equivalency with existed formalization, Hilbert state formalization, and he introduced the cut rule, and then he showed that from his system he can uh, eliminate cut, and that is called the cut elimination. Hauptsatz cut elimination theorem, we did it last time. So here is our system, which already I mentioned. It means we have uh, uh, our Gensen sequence, as we know what it is with Gensen arrow. And now to have intuitionistic sequence, R, the sequence, intuitionistic SQ, it means intuitionistic sequence is the sequence gamma implies delta, where delta consists of at most one formula. So you, that's how he did. He said here is in classical logic, delta can be any finite sequence. The difference between classical rules and intuitionistic rules is that delta can consist only from at most one formula at most one formula is zero and one. So, and then you have logical axioms. You have only one formula on this side and, and A on, the, on that side. And A now is any formula in our against and so, yeah. So you, you have at most one, so A implies A, but here you can have a sequence of formulas. And you have all, the structural rules, you cannot, you have to rewrite your structural rules uh, with the assumption that is one formula. So it means the weakening here is like classical, there's no, and delta you have to remember that this is zero on one, but if you have weakening on this side, it means here's empty, you can put A, so you must, you can, you can put A only if here is empty because zero and here is one. And uh, contraction is like in classical case, for example, but contraction on the uh, right side is impossible. You, you don't have, this is a classical contraction because you have here two, so you don't have that contraction rules. Exchange is the same. Again, the exchange on the right side is not exist, and now you have, you rewrite your conjunction or uh, logical rules as for classical, but you have to remember that delta is zero, one, so the classical, uh, the intuitionistic for conjunction on this side, you have only A, here's B, A and B. And here, delta, if you put, has at most one formula, and then you, you have now, for this junction, you must have two rules because this junction was A comma B. Now you have one rule. If you have A, you can write A or B. And you have second rule is if you have B, A or not B. So to prove A, if you want to prove, if you don't have cut, 
and you want to prove intuitionistically, if you want to find a proof intuitionistically in Gensen of A, B, you have to apply one rule, which would be proof of A, or you, or you apply a second rule, which you get B, so you have a proof of A or proof of B, and this is one or the other. So you have the, uh, the shortest proof of uh, uh, disjunction, a uh, probability of disjunction theorem. And then you, you uh, write all. The same for the negation. Uh, you have to write the rule if you have A, you have one formula, so here would be zero, and, and you can apply negation on the right side if this is, there's no formula here. And again, the system about all those rules. And of course, you have completeness, and Gensen proved the completeness by the Hauptsatz theorem. So, and then, uh, and then it was proof uh, already when you had the semantics by Bostovsky, the same completeness. Now, uh, and again, Im immediately, you have that against an intuitionistic uh, A or B, you have this, so you have intuitionistically the derivable uh, uh, disjunction. Uh, and Gensen proven by Hauptsatz by cut elimination, so that is exactly Gensen proof. And here I, I repeated what I wrote on the blackboard. And now uh, we have, you do, we have this nice system, uh, sequence system, and then we, uh, we do the same which we did for previous systems. And uh, of course now the proofs of, uh, in our Gensen intuitionistic system are more complicated than in classical, but Remember that in our RS system, the composition is always unique. In GL, which we did, the blind search defines a finite number of decomposition uh, trees. And now we have even more. Uh, in LI, which I just show you, the structural rules play a vital role of, of the proof. And the fact that a given decomposition tree ends in non-axiom leaf does not always imply that the proof does not exist. And, and, uh, and so it means only that we have not a good search, uh, search uh, strategy. And, and I'm going to give you uh, a, a decidable uh, procedure of, of finding uh, pr uh, proofs in, in the Gensel system. And then how you do it, you do the composition rules as we did before. So you we rewrite all those Gensen rules by the decomposition rules. Or if you like to facilitate the process, we write the decomposition rules like uh, as a tree rules and you, and you build as we did before. The implication would be like that. And then we bit, uh, then for example, weakening decomposition is that if you have A, you can, you can remove A. That's why it's called weakening. And, uh, and then you do, you say decomposable formula is the formula of degree greater than equal one. Decomposable sequence is a sequence which contains decomposable formulas. In decomposable formula, it's a formula of the degree zero, it means Proposition of variable is exactly the same definition. And again, uh, we, we, if we write capital letters, we treat these letters as proposition of variables because it's just sometimes, unless we have a spell out the proper formula. And then you have the normal uh, tree construction. Root of three is a sequence, given node, we then identify all decomposable rule applicable at this node and write premises as leaves. We stop the composition process when we obtain an axiom or leaves are indecomposable. 
But of course, that decomposition tree is not unique. And uh, the fact that the, we find the composition tree with non-axiom leaf, that does not me mean that we don't have. And that is due to a role of structural rules. And let's do an example. Uh, and that, this is an example. I have the formula. I identify the rule. And now I ident identify this rule. And I, I apply this rule as we did before. Now I apply conjunction to the first formula. I, I have this. And now I am here. And in order to, uh, in order to move that negation, I need to apply weakening. Because I cannot move negation. Classically, you can move the negation on this side. But intuitionistically, you must have it empty. So you apply the weakening. and you move B on the other side, and you have an axiom, and here's axiom. So this is one decomposition tree. And I, but it's, so it doesn't mean that the proof not exists. Maybe it exists if I do, a diff, if I do it in a different way. So it, it, it always say, only says it does not constitute the proof. And here I have another decomposition tree, tree for the same formula. And I did, you see, I, I, I start the same. And now, instead of decomposing this, I do the exchange. And I decompose that. And I have this. And now I do the exchange and exchange again to be able to decompose that. And I, I have this junction goes into two pieces. And now I want to decompose this. So I do the exchange. And I have A, this is empty, so I put A, and this is axiom. You see, but also remember the axiom in our classical systems, the axioms were all literals or all variables. Here, the axiom, if you keep decomposing, you get something which is not axiom, you stop here. So our axioms is any sequence where it has formula on both sides. And the same here, you have the axioms. And so remember, uh, I want to bring it back, because this is also the difference between our, uh, I'm looking for the axiom. Here, you see? In our classical case, here, gamma and delta, where everything was a variable, not a formula. And gamma and delta were variables. And here they, they are any formulas. So uh, the axiom is more complex, because you cannot go down decomposing everything, because it's uh, just more sophisticated. But it's still very uh, um, exciting, I think, that with such a complex and hard to understand uh, logic, intuitively hard to understand, you can still have automatic theorem proving. Where is a little bit more things to do? Uh, OK, so this is another. Ah, OK, so let's go back. Now, we know that intuition in intuitionistic logic, we cannot prove not dot a a. So let's look what's happening if I try to prove it in our Gensen system. So I'm looking for proof. Here I have one of two choices. And uh, here, to do anything, I have only weakening. That's one choice. Now, so I do it. But also, uh, and now, OK, that's for you to figure out. Here, I have one of two choices. Which choices are there? Here, I apply weakening, and I said one of three choices. Which three choices there are? But I choose weakening, and I have this. Now, again, if I sequence like that, it's one of three choices. Think which three choices there are. I choose the negation. I am here. And here, I have one of two choices. Which choices? 
and I choose, I have no axiom. So you can see I didn't cover all choices. This was, this, these were my choices. So I have now another for the same, for the same formula. I have, I choose this is one of two choices. Now I use contraction. This is the second of two choices and I double that formula. And now I use the weakening. It means get rid of this to be able to do something. This is a first of two choices. Which choices? Good exercise. And so I have not a, a on this side. Now I have one of two choices, which is I do this. I put the negation on this side. Now I do exchange. It's one of two choices with choices. And now I do the exchange. And now I, I do the negation. Again, negation is one of two choices. And now I get A not A. And I do in this direction. And I have non axiom that I constructed the tree because I had so many. Maybe I will have a tree with good choice, which would give as uh, axiom. So, so, or I have to show that there is no way I would get a, a tree which ends with axiom. So we can see that the composition tree, the blind construction of all possible trees leads more and more complicated trees. So we need to think about uh, how I make those choices and which is, which is the role of those structural rules. So, for example, blind application on contraction rule gives always infinite number of decomposition trees because you can put more and more and more of the same formula on the left side and you may never finish. So in order to decide one of them will produce a proof, we need an extra knowledge about patterns of their construction or just simply about the number of useful application of structural rules. You cannot eliminate those rules. So uh, for example, uh, structural rules, especially the contraction, complicates the searching task. Of course, our Gensen uh, RSGL, which we did, didn't have. We we got them by elimination of those, uh, uh, of, of those structural rules. Now we cannot eliminate in intuitionistic logic. So uh, we know another example. We know which, that A is a taut classical tautology if and only if double negation is probable. So it means that system is intuitionistic complete. So we have, we need to have a intuitionistic proof in our Gensel system of any double negation of classical tautology. So for example, we know that that is not intuitionistic tautology, but we must have in, we must find the proof, we must have the proof of uh, intuitionistic proof of double negation of that. So, and they're going to show that the contraction rules is essential to existence of, <coughs> of the proof of that formula. So it means that this is not probable without the contraction. And this is an example. And you can see that we have double negation, you use contraction, you use weakening, you use, <coughs> and <coughs> look, I got the axiom. So I found the proof. And, and that if you assume that contraction is not available, you will not get a proof. So <coughs> this is a very important rule. <coughs> and again, another tree without contraction you get a contradiction. Another tree without contraction, you get. And this is the last one. So I, I gave you all possible. If you don't have contraction, these are all possible. Search for the proof. 
so contraction, we cannot eliminate contraction. So uh, we show that uh, contraction rule cannot be eliminated be because we show an example of probable formula with contraction, and without contraction, there's no proof. And then you have proof search method. So we make certain observations to have a heuristic method. It means the goal of construction decomposition tree is to obtain axioms or in decomposable leaves. With respect to this goal, we use logical decomposition rules a priority. So <coughs> we try to do as much as we can with logical, and then uh, and then we we apply uh, our contractions or our uh, structural rules as secondary. So uh, and. There's another important uh, thing that all logical decomposition rules on the left side, and for any connective on the left side, uh, so <coughs> must have a formula you want to decompose as the first formula, right? Because that, that's how they are structured. So you need on this side. If we want to decompose the formula on this node, uh, it must have of that form. So uh, sometimes it's necessary to decompose the formula within the sequence gamma first. So you use the exchanges and you see which one is the most convenient on this side because you can do. So wait. For example, if you have a node like this, you can decompose this, but you can do exchange and decompose that, and you can get the proof from this order and not get a proof of that order. So this is remark, and this is example. If I do this, I get non-axiom, and if I if I do weakening, and then I do here, I do the weakening. So, and then I get rid of this, I get that, and now I can decompose, uh, and then I can do, uh, again, uh, the negation on this side, and now I do exchange, and I do, I have no axiom. And now, if I, I do differently, if I start for A and B, Instead of this, I, I, I change the order and I decompose, I have immediately the axiom. So the order on the left side is important. And then you have more. So the method, and this is the method. First, you use logical rules where applicable. Use each exchange rule to decompose via logical rules as many formulas on the left side because you don't lose any information. Remember, the order of decomposition matters, so you have to cover different choices. Use weakening only as must basis because weakening just gets rid of, rid of a formula. And also use contraction as the last recourse and only to formulas that contain negation. The contraction matters with negation and implication. And let's call a formula A to which apply contraction, a contraction formula. The only contraction formula are formulas containing negation between their uh, logical connectives. And within the process of constructions of all possible trees, use contraction rule only to the contraction formulas. And then if you have contraction formula appearing on a node uh, of the decomposition tree. So if you have C is a contraction formula, for any contraction formula C, any node N, we apply contraction rule to the formula at most S. That is important because you can do contraction. It means repeat that formula infinite number of times, at most as many times as the number of sub-formulas of the formula. And if we find the tree with all axiom leaves, we have a proof. If all trees finite number, 
with this, because you have here uh, the number of contractions, have non axiom leaf. We, we prove that proof does not exist. So that is, uh, and we prove completeness uh, of that procedure. So now we are almost done. Part five. This is a short introduction to modal logic. And uh, again, a very general uh, explanation of algebraic semantics uh, for modal logic as far as five. As I said, they were the only, the first semantics for any modal logic. By then, there were already like 100 modal logics without semantics. So, uh, and that this were first ever semantics from two modal logics. So, then non-classical logics can be divided in two groups. Those who rival classical logic and those which extend, like Wukasiewicz, Klini, intuitionistic logics are in the first group. They are rival to classical logic. And the modal logic are extend classical logic. So the rival logic do not differ from classical logic in terms of the language. They are rival, but the language is the same. In modal logic, you add, you enrich the language, but you keep uh, all classical tautologies within the classical connectives. So the rival logic differed at certain theorems or tautologies of classical logic are rendered false or not probable. And the most notorious Example is excluded uh, middle, which is probable, and is a tautology of classical, not probable, and not tautology, intuitionistic, and many others. So, and it is also not a tautology under any extensional logic semantics we have discussed in chapter three. Logic which extends classical sanction all the theorems of classical logic, but generally uh, they supplement them in two ways. First, the language of non-classical logic, an extension of the language of classical logic. And secondly, the theorems of these non-classical logic supplement those of classical logic. And modal logics, are enriched by addition of two new connectives that represent the meaning that represent the meaning of the, of a, that represent the meaning of intuit of uh, natural language expression it is necessary so you have i and we use the notation which we already explained before we use notation i for it is necessary that and c for it is possible. Other notation are nabla and L for necessary and diamond PM for possible. And we, uh, so that those two are the most commonly used. We use I, fat I and C for possible, uh, which I did, we did already in chapter three to get you used to the fact that you can those notation represent just this, the, you read those connectives like that, there is no semantics. And uh, symbols NLPM, or like I often use in computer science, symbols uh, uh, delta and, and diamond were first used in modern logic literature, and we use those symbols because they come from algebraic and topological interpretation. E, I correspond to the topological interior of a set and C to the closure of the set and the models are topological, so that's why you use that notation. Okay, the idea of modal logic was first formulated by American philosopher uh, Lewis in 1918. Lewis has proposed yet another interpretation 
of logical implication, he created a notion of modal truth, which led to the notion of modal logic. He did, not, he did it in attempt to avoid what some felt the paradoxes of semantics of classical implication, which accept true that a false sentence implies any sentence, right? Our classical implication, and we, uh, so uh, philosophers said that, that uh, oh, my, maybe in mathematics, but this is, this is not really what we want. So uh, unlike classical connective, the modal connective do not admit truth functional interpretation. It means do not admit extensional semantics. We defined the class of extensional semantics. They were by functions, connectives are functions. That does not work for modal connectives. So, and that was the reason for which modal logic was first developed as a proof system. Said, oh, my possibility has such axioms, but what semantically it means, I don't know. But we agree that our intuitive notion of possibility necessity can be this and can be that. And we examine how they behave with implication, disjunction, conjunction. That's why. Uh, many uh, modal logics were developed by setting different axioms for intuitive notion of possibility and necessity. So the first definition of modal semantics and have proofs of completeness theorem came about 20 years later from development like first 30 or 40 modal logics. And then it took another 25 years for discovery and development of the second and more general approach to modal logic semantics. And then that was Starsky, and here was Kripke. Well, that's why Kripke is modern mathematics genius. So historically, the first modal semantics was due to Marquis and Tarski. 44. It is topological semantics that provides a powerful mathematical interpretation for some modal logic. It means S4, S5. And the, the modal notion is interior of the set and possibility and, and modal notion of possibility is a closure of the set. That's why we use those symbols. And, and the most recent was Kripke 64. So 44, 64. Roughly say, uh, in our semantics, in, in Kripke semantics, we say that formula CA, CA is possible A, is true if A is true in some possible word called actual world. So he introduces the, the whole universe of different possible necessary worlds, and that's the whole uh, way he, he structured the, the semantics. And we say that formula I, A, so necessary A is true if A is true in every possible world. So and that also corresponds to uh, quantifiers, every possible, there is possible world, and so on. We represent here a short version of topological semantics in a form of algebraic logic and algebraic models, and we leave Kripke semantics to explore. And uh, ah, they are very good um, um, exercises and very good explanation on YouTube. So I leave it for exploration. OK, um, so modal logic were first developed, as was intuitionistic logic, in a form of proof system. First Hilbert style modal proof system was published by Lewis and Lang Langford in 32. They presented formalization of two modal logic, S1, S2. And then they went three, four, five, thirty, and now you have hundreds of modal logics had been created, and they are being created um, all the time. So uh, 
between the others, which are important, Hughes and Craswell, 69, are the books for philosophical motivation for various modal logics. Bowen in, in 79 for detailed and uniform study of Kripke models. Very, very uh, basic and very good book. And Segeberg, 71, excellent modal logic classification, fitting, 1983, for extended and uniform studies of automated proof methods, methods for classical and modal logic, fitting method the, uh, is, um, is uh, he does by semantic tableaus, which is a connection with resolution. Again, I, we don't cover semantic tableaus and we don't cover resolution because we cannot cover everything. So uh, fitting is, is, is a very good uh, reading to follow. Okay, so now we, uh, we present the classical Hilbert style formalization, Duma, Kins, and Tarski, and Rashova and Sikorsky. And then we discuss the relationship between those two models logic and between modal logics as for an intuitionistic logic, as first was observed by Gödel. And um, so modal language, you have classical, our connectives and you have two modal connectives and we read formulas necessary and possible and uh, the language is common to all modal logics just semantics or, or, or axiom systems are different so modal logic different on the choice of axioms and rules of inference when static as a proof system or relatively on a choice of respective semantics so, uh, Bakis and Tarski, you have all classical axioms, and then it means we adopt classical axiom and a complete set of classical axioms. So, what I say, they extend. So, here you have all complete set of classical axioms, so you have all classical tautologies, and then you have modal axioms, which say, interior of A implies A, uh, and, uh, or necessary A implies A, necessary A implies B, implies necessary A implies necessary B, and necessary A implies necessary than necessary than A, and, and here is uh, closure of A is necessary the closure of A, and uh, modus ponens, and you have a rule this is called a uh, necess necessitation rule, which was introduced by Gödel. That if you have A, you have I A, and then and now you have S four R M one M three. So that is up to here S four, and S five you add one more axiom, and S five is M one and four. And the rules are the same. So these are two logic. And of course, axiom S of S5, as we stated, this is a nice extend S5, extend the axiom as a 4. So we get immediately anything probable in S4 is probable, probable in S5. And also, uh, in S4 and S5, the modal connectives are definable by each other. So that is like with the interior and closure of a set. It means necessary than A is not true that probable that not A and vice versa. Or interior of a set is uh, complementation of closure of complementation of a set. And the language, we assume the same language uh, with one model connective, because you can see if you have one model connective, you can define the other. So to have a less of uh, work, you can, uh, you can adopt only one uh, of those connectives as, uh, uh, in our language. And now you have a nice, uh, again, uh, logical axioms. You, 
uh, again, you choose the, this equivalent to the axioms um, in the respect of, of uh, probability and equivalent in a, in, a, in a sense of semantics to the axioms I just gave you. And, and here are the axioms of they are nice because, again, they are chosen to, they're the most comfortable to prove completeness theorem through algebraic methods. So that's why we use those axioms. And again, now the rule of inference is A implies B, IA implies IB, and again, S5 extends S, uh, S5 extends S4, and this is our rule of inference. And then, of course, you have the same RS4A implies that RS5A is probable. And now, the algebraic uh, semantics are defined in the notion of uh, topological Boolean algebra. So topological semantics was initiated by Bankin, say, Tarski in 46, and consequently developed in the field of algebraic logic. The algebraic approach is presented in mathematics of mathematics. And then there's another beautiful book uh, uh, of an algebraic approach to non-classical logic, and there's the next book. But to mention, which is important, that the first idea of connection between modal propositional logic and topology, because these are all I and C are topological operation, was due in 38 by Chinese mathematician, Tang Tsao Chen, and Du Gunji in 1940. So, and then uh, it was done really by Tarski and Makis and Tarski and the other. So, now uh, algebraic models for classical logic were done in the terms of Boolean algebras. Algebraic models for intuitionistic logic were developed in terms of pseudo Boolean algebras. And now for modal logic, we introduce the notion of topological Boolean algebra. It means you have Boolean algebra and you have two, one, because the other you can define in terms, you have interior operation, which has this properties. Interior of, of A and B is interior A and B, etc. So you have, uh, and that is called topological Boolean algebra. And element AI is called interior of A, and element not I negation not A is called closure. So really you have the finability, so you can have topological Boolean algebra if you introduce uh, C as like that. So you, you can have always topological Boolean algebra with two operations, which is convenient. Uh, and, and, and here are the property of closure, which you do. Now you have the same connection with, with Boolean algebra had a connection with algebra of set. So now topological Boolean algebra has connection with a topological field of sets. And you introduce open topological Boolean algebra, which are special Boolean algebra. You say topological Boolean algebra is open when every open element is closed and every closed element is open, that for any element of Boolean algebra, closure of I, of interior of A is interior. So, so that means any closed element is, uh, every closed element is closed and every open element is closed. And this is called open topological Boolean algebra. And we say closely, loosely, that formula A is a modal S4 tautology if and only if any topological Boolean algebra is a model of A. 
like we did for pseudo-Boolean algebra. And we say topological, so S4 is characterized by normal topology, topological Boolean algebra, and S5 is characterized by open topological Boolean algebra. And uh, so, and we say modal algebraic model is for any A in the modal language, and topological Boolean algebra is a model, and we write Boolean algebra is a model, if and only if V star of A in the universe of the algebra holds for all variable assignments into the, so you see, this is exactly the same uh, definition, except that now modal means that you have a topological Boolean algebra, and then you have S4 tautology. You say that, that A is a modal S4 tautology and is denoted by S4 tautology A, if and only if, for all topological algebras are models for A, and, and S5 tautologies if all clo open topological algebras. And this is for intuitionistic logic, what was the definition? Definition was that, that uh, you have intuitionistic tautology if and only if for all pseudo-Boolean algebras, you have exactly the same, and extension of classical tautology, which are called classical uh, Boolean models, is that we say that A is classical tautology if all Boolean algebra are models for A. And then you have completeness theorem, uh, and then you have, of course, like we did for intuitionistic logic, and we also have for classical, uh, that algebraic completeness theorem, probability, tautology, and now again you can see this is the same condition which we had uh, for intuitionistic logic. It means, what does it mean? Remember that those modal connectives are not extensional, so you cannot have decidability by those what we call the truth tables. We, but we have the citability because we say that A is a tautology if it's valid in every topological algebra of at most 2 to the power 2 to the power R. So you have a finite number of topological Boolean algebra, which is even more complex than pseudo-Boolean algebra, but there's a finite number and you have, uh, and you have uh, the citability of S4. Now, if you want to see how it looks in real topology, you say that it's tautology that is the whole space for every variable v and the assignment in the topological subset of dense, dense in itself metric space A. So they are characterized by subset of dense in itself metric space X, in particular n-dimensional Euclidean space, you get to really real mathematics and topology. And for S5 is similar. And uh, so, but your algebra are clo open topological and you have similar uh, decidability uh, uh, theorem with the same condition, 2 to the power 2 to the power r, where r is the number of subformulas of formula A. And also we have uh, decidability, which I just said, so I stated it here uh, as a theorem, so it was already uh, uh, I uh, discussed. Syntactical decidability, I have to sort of did some work when I was very young. Uh, and uh, that's probably how I am still doing what I am doing, <laughs> sort of 50 years later. Uh, so I did syntactic decidability through the Gensel systems. Uh, and, uh, and it was my first really very serious result. And uh, which I didn't put here, 
which at that time, it was very important problem because it is important. But as I was also studying as out of curiosity, computer science, and I got my degree in computer science, I wrote a program because if you do theoretically, you do this beautiful uh, type of automatic theorem proving system. So I was, we wrote, I had the help and we wrote a program. So it's many years later, I, just, I realized that was the first theorem uh, provable model as far as by logic written, but we only stated in the article as two sentences. But uh, no, that was, oh, I even wrote it, yeah. So present algebraic proof of completeness in implementation in Lisp Alcon, Algol, and I did it with collaboration with Ali Gursky because he was a good, um, mm, he was a good programmer. So, uh, and then uh, the relationship between S4 S5 was first established by Onishi Matsumoto in 57-59. And that was how you connect uh, S4. So it means it said the formula is S4 prov probable or tautology if ICA. So once you have uh, uh, whatever theorem prover for S4, you have theorem prover for S5. And again, in the inverse is the same. You have A, and here is this. That was a very beautiful result. And, uh, and of course, remember, we had uh, the um, intuitionistic di disjunction. And here you have four uh, uh, separation of probability of disjunction. And Marquis and Tarski in 48 proved that modal disjunction AI or IB is S4 probable if and only if. So, so intuitionistic A or B holds, but here in modal S4, AI or IB holds if and only if S4A or S4B. That's a very nice uh, separation uh, probability. And that brings also to uh, to the whole uh, connection between intuitionistic logic and S4 logic. And that was Gödel who first considered connection between them. And uh, Gödel's proof was purely syntactic in nature because there were no semantics, yes. And, and the algebraic Proof was done by Makis and Tarski in 48 when they invent, invented semantics. So, uh, and what Gedel Tarski did, uh, he, wait, I'm sorry because I, uh, uh, what Gedel and Tarski did, he did it by um, mapping uh, of between classical in, in S4 and intuitionistic logic. And here is, um, you have the propositional model logic, and then we obtain a language L0 obtained from L by elimination of the connective, modal connective, and by replacement the classical negation. This is our classical negation by intuitionistic negation. So use different symbol. So, and then we obtain the language like that. And this replacement is the mapping. I'm going to show you the mapping. So we get the, uh, the language L0 with intuitionistic negation, uh, which is called propositional language of intuitionistic logic. And, and the connection is between the model and intuitionistic logic is done by this mapping, and the mapping is defined like that. And this is gödel tarski mapping that you have F0, you map into F such that F of A is IA. This is, and this is intuitionistic, and this is our model. And F of A implies B is interior 
of FAFB, F of disjunction is interior of, is F of A of B, so that is like the normal distribution, and F of negation, intuitionistic negation, is interior of uh, normal negation. So that's why we have, oh, I just raised that uh, intuitionistic negation is interior of uh, uh, of classical negation. And then you, you have how this mapping lets, and then they prove that for any formula, A, A is intuitionist of the language such intuitionistic language is probable intuitionistically if and only if FA is modally. So you, so you have the connection between intuitionistic and S4 uh, logic. And then you can go uh, um, in more, um, you can do between the classical associate the modal formula and you can play with those mappings and you have the Gödel, uh, Gödel Tarski theorem that you have uh, here you have classical and here you have uh, mod, uh, you have um, modal language and uh, and then you have the probability classical H is proof system classical and here is when that mapping gives you the modal. And that, uh, that was what, but it was very interesting because all those works were done uh, only uh, by, um, uh, by proof systems before we had a semantics. Okay, enough of modal logic, enough of intuitionistic logics. We are going to go back to, um, to classical logic predicate classical logic next time. Thank you.